Kamek Village, Little Rock, a Salem Media Group station, 101.1 FM, The Answer. Oh. Good afternoon. Welcome to the services of Saline Missionary Baptist Church in Tull, Arkansas, which is located outside of Benton, about 10 minutes. We're glad that you're joining us today here on 101.1 FM, The Answer, or via Facebook Live. We're glad to have you uh, joining us to look into the Word of God. If you'd like a copy of today's notes, you can go up to our website, not only for the copy of the notes, but also for other information regarding the church and things and activities that are going on. I will share with you that we are going to resume our uh, corporate worship on May 31st, Sunday, May 31st at 11 o'clock. We will be doing worship only that morning, and uh, we will not be doing any of the small classes. We're going to work our way into that under the directives as given by the health department. Uh, but in the meantime, if you would like to uh, get a copy of the notes, you can go up to Celine NBC. That's Celine is in the county. NBC is in missionarybaptistchurch.org and get a copy of today's notes uh, for the sermon that I'll be bringing in just a minute. Uh, again, we'll be starting on May 31st, and we do intend to continue our Facebook Live service. We are working on that now to get all those details up and going. So when we come together on May 31st, we'll be able to continue what we started through this ministry. Uh, this morning, I have Tim Beard, one of our church members, joining us to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look at God's Word about overcoming fear. Tim, good to have you with us this morning. Would you mind leading us in a word of prayer? Thank you, Lord, for this day and this opportunity to open your Word. I just pray that you bless, uh, bless the message that Brother Kim is going to bring, and just ask a blessing on all those out there that are listening today. Lord, just thank you again for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross to forgive us for our sins. And, and I take comfort in, in knowing that with you as my Savior, I, I don't have the fear and, and the uncertainty that's it's so prevalent in this world. Uh, we know that fear and uncertainty doesn't come from you, Lord. Or just, um, just be with our members as we've been disconnected a little bit. We'll be back together next Sunday. Thank you. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. So overcoming fear. When you mention the word fear, it can actually stimulate fear in people's mind. And fear feeds into other reactions of humanity. It can create panic. It can create anxiety. It can create restlessness. Today, we live in such a state of fear that it can control our every move if we let it. That is why fear is such a powerful tool of manipulation if it's placed in the wrong hands. I want you to consider all the TV shows that have built their script around feeding on people's fears. You consider the show Fear of the Walking Dead, or Fear Factor, or Destination Fear, or Trending Fear. Think of all the movies that Stephen King has scripted that have been designed with the intent of creating and bringing about fear in people's lives. Fear in the wrong hands can be equivalent to a nuclear bomb being in the wrong hands, but fear in the right hands can bring about peace, purpose, and power where otherwise fear might dominate a person's life. Many people cannot enjoy life today because they are dominated by fear. In fact, if you think about it as a society, we are conditioned to be afraid. In these times that we live today dealing with the COVID-19 and the economic uncertainty and all the other things that bring about fear in our life, we are stimulated. We are conditioned to be afraid. But I want you to think about this. When you're not enjoying life because you're too afraid of what's in life, you're as good as dead because fear has killed your joy of living. Let me say that again. 
when you're not enjoying life because you're too afraid of what's in life, you're as good as dead because fear has killed your joy of living. This is not the environment that God wants us to live in. This is not the way that he has conditioned us in his word. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7, this is not God's will for your life. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When we think about fear, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to fear him. But when you think about fear, when it's in the hands of Satan, he uses it to intimidate us, to suppress us, to manipulate us, to discourage us. He uses fear in so many ways that it drives us away from God. Whenever it is that we're in a right relationship with God, we are in fearful, we are in a fearful way as far as wanting to live within the confinement of God's word because we know that within the confinement of God's word is safety. God does not use fear as a means of intimidation. God uses fear as a means of protection. Fear in the hands of Satan is intended to drive us away from God. You look at how that Satan has removed the fear of God from society today. You look at how Satan has caused man not to be fearful of God. That can only tell you one thing, that Satan wants to use fear in a manner in which it benefits him and distances us from God. That is why we see in God's word, we see that God said he has not given us the spirit of fear, but instead, what has he replaced that spirit of fear with? He has replaced it with power. Power to do what? Power to overcome the fears that Satan puts in our heart that would otherwise limit us and condition us to be so afraid that we cannot enjoy living life here on this earth. God has given us the spirit of power, but also he's given us the spirit of love. And love can cover a multitude of sins. Love can give us an unlimited power in order to be able to release us from the fears that otherwise would do not dominate us. And he has also given us a sound mind. He's given us the ability to go to his word and to think about what his word says about the fear that Satan puts in our heart. Sometimes fear causes people to lose their mind and do crazy things, but God has given us a sound mind. He's given us a mind that we can understand, that we can be more powerful and overcome fear that otherwise would dominate us. There's more to life than fear of what's in life. Now, let me ask you a question. To whose advantage is it to get you to exist in a life of fear? Is it to God's advantage or to Satan's advantage? You've already answered the question because you know. It's to Satan's advantage to get us to live a life dominated by fear. Because if he can dominate us by fear, he'll use everything at his disposal that brings fear into our life in order to control us. The thing about fear of God is it's not intimidating intended to control us, but it's intended to release us that we can enjoy a life filled with maybe fears, but not dominated by those things that create and bring that fear. Fear feeds on fear. If you want to kill fear in your life, we need not only to know how to stop feeding it, but we need to stop feeding into it. Let me say that again. Fear feeds on fear. If we want to kill fear in our lives, we not only have to stop feeding it, but we also have to stop feeding into it. A person who is dominated by fear cannot self-prescribe their way out of it. Overcoming fear is a combination of life experiences, guidance, encouragement, dedication, admission, and redirection away from an old thought pattern that has proved useless or else we still wouldn't be dominated by fear in maybe a particular area in your life. Let me give you some quotes that I researched and found regarding fear that kind of gives you a perspective of how people throughout life have viewed fear. I'm not going to name the individuals that have said these things. You can get those off the notes, but I do want to read you a list because they kind of uh, capture the ideas behind what fear does as far as impacting our life. 
First one, too many people are thinking of security instead of opportunity. They seem to be more afraid of life than death. Of all the liars in the world, the second one says, sometimes the worst are our own fears. Ignorance is the parent of fear. The next one, false evidence appearing real. We are more often frightened than hurt, and we suffer more from imagination than from reality. Fear is only as deep as the mind allows. Instead of worrying about what people say of you, why not spend time trying to accomplish something they will admire about you? One of the greatest discoveries a man makes, one of his greatest surprises, is to find that he can do what he is afraid that he couldn't do. The only thing we have to fear, and say it with me, is fear itself. You can discover what your enemy fears most often by observing the means he uses to frighten you. Fear makes you feel your humanity. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. Fear defeats more people than any other thing in the world. Do the thing you fear to do and keep on doing it. That is the quickest and surest way ever that you'll discover to conquer fear. I've learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Everything you want is on the other side of fear. I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. It's not death that a man should fear, but he should fear never beginning to live. Fear is a dark room where negatives develop. Never be afraid to try something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark and professionals built the Titanic. Feed your faith, and your fears will starve to death. Those were all quotes that came from individuals that if you go up and get the notes and you look at the names associated with them, those are all people of achievement, as we would say, in life. They learn through personal experience, through all the things I mentioned a while ago that are necessary, that you can't self-prescribe your way out of it. This is a combination of life experience, guidance, encouragement, dedication, admission, and redirection away from old thought patterns that have proved useless. And instead, they have transformed to a new way of thinking about dealing with fear. What all these quotes summarize and what they show us, if you were to look an accumulated list of what people are afraid of, we're fearful of living, yet we fear death. We fear relationships, but we fear being alone. We fear the unknown, and we fear knowing too much. We, feel fa we fear failure in trying. We fear having never tried at all. We fear success, and we feel failure. We fear being defeated. We fear insecurity. We're afraid of fear itself, and we fear what people will say about us. We fear overstaying our welcome. We fear being manipulated. We fear missed opportunities. We fear rejection. We fear how we will handle ourselves in if whether or not we are accepted or rejected. We live in fear as a choice. We fear we have no choice. We fear our past. We fear our present. And we fear our future. Fear is good, but fear can also be bad. Fear is like any other tool that molds and shapes us in life. It all depends on whose hands it's in. When used by Satan, fear is used for less honorable intentions as a tool of manipulation that is intended to keep us off balance so that we never gain solid footing in life in order that we might live a fearless life. This leads us to live a life in fear. When God, or when used by God, fear is used as a means to develop us by forging us with a strong resolve that will help us conquer our fears that would otherwise hinder us from doing God's will in our lives.
This is the more satisfying experience, having conquered our fears. Unlike other matters in life, you have a choice in whose hand you place fear. You have a choice as to whether or not fear will dominate you or it will be a tool used by you to build your resolve, to overcome your fear, and whatever else may be coming down the road of life. And while inspirational quotes, as I read a while ago, have their value and purpose to inspire us, they alone are not sufficient to equip us to defeat fear that dominates our lives. Fear is not dominated or fear is not defeated by one-liners and quotes. Quotes are of men. What we need is a source that is of God. For found in that source will be the strength that we need and the direction that we need in order to face our fears, but more than just face them, but to dominate them and conquer them before they dominate and conquer us. To conquer fear, we must rely on a source that has a history of being fearless and that fear has never conquered. Fear's greatest fear is that it will be defeated. Even fear is afraid. Fear is fearful that it will be defeated. That's why whenever you issue the words of 1 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. To defeat fear, you have to go to a supply source that is stronger than fear itself, and that again is God's Word. The Bible says, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. When you go back and you read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, let me remind you of what it said because it ties in directly to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You see, God's love for what he did for us on the cross of Calvary defeated fear in our life if we will live in the remembrance of God's love for us. He goes on and he says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I want you to think about what you're afraid of today. I want you to think about what fear is doing to you today. I want you to think of how fear is conquering your life today. And notice what he said in Romans chapter 8, 37 through 39, which I just read. He said, for I am persuaded. In other words, he has been convinced. He has been to court. He has won the case. The jury has ruled, and he has come out triumphant. He is persuaded that neither death, do you fear death today? He says that nor life, do you fear living today? Nor principalities, nor powers, are you afraid of the powers and the principalities that may rule over you? Nor things present, you know, one of the things I mentioned a while ago that people fear, they fear their past, they fear their present, and they fear their future. Nor things to come. There's the futuristic part of it. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. What is it that surrounds you with fear? Regardless of how high you go or how low you go, how wide you go, is fear always there in your life? Nor any other creature. What we need to be reminded of is not so much what we are afraid of, but what we need to remind ourselves of is that none of these things can separate us from the love of God And in that knowledge alone gives us the ability to conquer our fears because no matter what happens here in life while we live, knowing that death one day will face us, that nothing is going to separate us from the love of God, which will take us into his presence when we die and we depart this earth. The first step to overcoming what you're afraid of is to ask yourself this question, is what I'm afraid of able to separate me from the love of God? Because if we are not able to be separated from the love of God, everything that you may be fearful of is not able to conquer you because the love of God has secured you for all of eternity. You see, as a lost person without Christ as your Savior, 
the question you need to ask yourself is this. Have I been able to overcome what I'm afraid of absent of the love of Christ in my life? You know, the one thing that if you get to the root of what people are most fearful of, when you get to what really causes them to be afraid, it's the fact that they know one day they're going to die. Without Christ in your life, the greatest fear you have, the greatest fear factor you have is death because you know that you cannot conquer death, that only Christ was able to conquer death. Steve Jobs said this, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the biggest choices in my life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. What is truly important in your life is that you have a time in your life where you know that you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and to give you the wonderful gift of eternal life that was purchased by his love demonstrated on the cross of Calvary, where he faced all fears having been tempted in all points such as we are. He faced the fear of death dying on the cross of Calvary, living in the confidence of knowing that his father was going to resurrect him and give him eternal life. When you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've experienced that love, and that love is the source of strength that helps us confront everything that we are afraid of here on this earth, no matter what source it may reside in. We know that because of the love that Christ has placed in us through a personal relationship with Christ as our Savior, we are more than conquerors through Him. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you may not be afraid of anything on this earth, but you certainly have something to be afraid of for all eternity, and that is being separated from that love of God, absent to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you never accepted him as your Savior, you don't have that strength of knowing that upon death you'll spend an eternity with God, but instead you'll be separated for an eternity in hell with Satan who instilled fear in your heart throughout all of your life. The most important step you'll take to overcoming your fear is to know that you have a personal relationship with Christ who has conquered our greatest fear, which is dying and what is beyond death. Once you have that issue resolved, you can face in this life whatever fear you may have with the knowledge that it cannot be robbed of you of what only the love of Christ has secured for you. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now, I think that scripture speaks to a couple points. Number one, are you tormented by whatever it is that you're fearful of today? The love of Christ can resolve that. If you're a lost person having never accepted Christ as your Savior and you are fearful of dying because you know that you haven't resolved the spiritual issue of accepting Christ as your Savior, you can deal with that issue today and ask Christ to forgive you of your sins and give you the gift of eternal life. The second thing that I think that Scripture teaches is this, that if you do know Christ as your Savior, but you're not living in the abundance of the love that Christ gave to you on the cross of Calvary, represented in the fact that you are more fearful than you are alive in Christ. You are more fearful of what this world may do or not do. You may be more fearful of from that list, that laundry list I gave you a while ago. You are not living in the full power of God's love, knowing that nothing on this earth should cause you such fear that you forget to live life on this earth fearlessly, knowing that when you die, Christ is going to call you home to eternity. As God's children, we must pull from the arsenal of God's Word, which is a well-equipped tool to meet every fear factor in our lives. Because what has already been mentioned, consider what God's Word reminds us of in Isaiah 41 and 10 that can equip you to address your fears. In Isaiah 41 and 10, it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. 
Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Let's break that verse down. Not to fear is a command. He said, fear thou not. Fear is not something you can avoid, but is something that you can choose how you respond to it. Fear is a part of life. It happens. It comes in unannounced. It can find various avenues in which it introduces itself into our life, whether that's fear of a disease or fear of a job loss or fear of health issues or fear of whatever. Things happen in life, and through those things that happen in life, we have to make a choice when they do. Are we going to live in fear, or are we going to live in the power of God's love, as I mentioned a while ago? Fear is not something you can avoid, but it's something that you can choose how you respond to. Fear focuses you to make a decision of who you will trust to help you overcome it. When situations of fear occur in your life, you must make a decision as to who you're going to trust. Now, when I go back up to 1 John 4 and 18, it said, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. As a child of God, what that means, tying it in with Isaiah 41 and verse 10, where we were commanded not to fear, what that means is that in that moment that fear introduces or a situation that brings fear with it introduces itself into our life, we have to make a decision as to who we're going to trust to help us overcome that. If you don't have a personal relationship with Christ as your Savior, the best you can hope for is to resort to one-liners and how-tos. But when you are a child of God, you have something better, and you need to make the choice as to whether you're going to go to the ways world of dealing with your fear or you're going to resort back to your strength that you can find in God and his word. Because he tells us in his word in Isaiah 41 and 10 that we are not to fear. Second thing that verse tells us is that God is always with us. Let me ask you a question as a child of God. When has God not been with you? When has God not been with you? As a lost person, God has never been with you because you've never asked Christ to be with you. The way that you get God to be with you to help you deal with your fears in this earth is to ask Christ to come and be with you by asking him to be your Savior. The Bible says in Psalm 118 and verse 6, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. Now let me break that scripture down because it's broken into three parts. The Lord is on my side. As a child of God, we know the Lord is always on our side. The second thing it says is I will not fear. Why will I not fear? Because we've been commanded not to fear, and we have no reason to fear because the love of God is in us, and God has demonstrated his Lord toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And nothing can separate us from the love of God. The third thing that verse said in Psalm 118 and 6 is this. What can man do unto me? What is there in life that introduces fear into our lives that can separate us from the love of God? What can man do to us that God can't protect us from? When you go on and you break that verse down a little bit more, the next thing it says in Isaiah 40 and 10, 1 and 10 is, do not be dismayed. In other words, do not be disheartened. What is one of the goals or objectives of Satan instilling fear in your life? What's one of the goals or objectives that Satan has in instilling fear into your life? His intent is to get you disheartened. His intent is to get you to quit. His intent is to get you to rely on him and less on God. His intent is to get you focused more on what his solutions to the problems that are creating fear in your life are instead of looking to God and the solutions that God has for you. His overall goal in introducing fear into your life is to get you to be dismayed, disoriented, and disheartened. That's why the Bible says in John chapter 14 and verse 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. He was speaking that to his disciples and everybody else that was living in an environment that was disheartening. They were dismayed. They were disoriented. They were disillusioned. And in the middle of all that, he said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do you trust in God? Then trust in me. It all boils down to who do you trust? The next thing Isaiah 41 to 10 
introduces is the thought of control. Who's in control? God cannot control what you do not relinquish to him. He may be God that created the universe. He may be the God that molded you from the dust of the earth and breathed into you the breath of life. He may be the God that knew you in your mother's womb before you were even conceived, but God cannot control what you are not willing to relinquish to him. If fear has a grip on your life and you are holding on to fear as tightly as fear is holding on to you, you are depriving yourself of relinquishing control of it over to God so God can do for you what you have already proven you've not been able to do for yourself or you would not continue to be dominated by fear. Now, God can make you wish you would have relinquished control over to him, and that's where a healthy fear of God comes in. Bible says in Psalms 56 and 3, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Whenever it is that I am afraid, I will trust in you, God. The next thing Isaiah 41 and 10 reveals to us is that he will strengthen us to help us overcome our fear. We cannot control how fear may enter our lives, but we can control how long it stays, how long it dominates, and how much power we give it. 1 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of sound mind. We read that of Scripture a while ago. Proverbs 29.25 reinforces that Scripture in that it says, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. You see, you can continue to be dominated by fear, and all it's going to do is wrap you and entangle you deeper into the snare. Or you can break loose from it by putting your trust in the Lord, knowing that he loves you enough to see you through it. Next thing Isaiah 41 and 10 says, he will not leave us alone to do it on our own, but he will help us. When we realize that we do not have to face our fears alone, it brings fear down to size. You know, sometimes the things that introduce fear into my life are a lot bigger because I give them credit. But when I realize and when I bring back into focus in that moment where I have to make a choice as to whatever that circumstance is that's introducing fear in my life, when I have to, in that moment, make a decision which path I'm going to follow, when I realize that we don't have to face, uh, when I realize I don't have to face my fears alone, all of a sudden that fear diminishes. All of a sudden that fear gets smaller. And then God will bring a verse like Psalm 23 and 4 into the equation. And he'll say, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy, st thy staff, they comfort me. The psalmist realized that when David had to deal with all the things that he had to deal with, including his past mistakes, his future challenges and enemies that were waiting for him while he lived presently in the day. The one thing that he was able to speak that reveals to me that he brought his fear down to size was when he said that even though he was facing the valley of the shadow of death, he had no reason to fear. Why? Because God reminded, not only was he with him, but as a shepherd, he brought his rod and he brought his staff, and the strength of God comforted him to know that God was bigger than anything that he had to fear. The last thing Isaiah 41 and 10 reminds us of is that God has more than enough strength to deal with whatever is trying to overpower us. Fear is like a bully. It's not used to people standing up to it. I'll say that again. Fear is like a bully. It's not used to people standing up to it. Isaiah 41 and 13 says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help you. Does fear have a grip on you? Are you too afraid to move? You don't know which way to turn? Bible said in Psalms 34 and 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You know, the one thing Satan's trying to get you not to hear is the voice of God telling you, it's okay. I know you're in a situation. You may be in a crisis. 
You may be in a situation you have no control over, and you're having, having to wait on the Lord. The one thing that God wants you to remember, he said, I sought the Lord. Have you sought the Lord in this? Well, if you sought the Lord, then he heard you. It doesn't mean maybe he gave you the answer that you were looking for. And it certainly doesn't mean that he maybe is going to deliver you at this time from the situation that is stimulating so much fear in your life. But the one thing he does promise us is that he will deliver us from all our fears. You know, sometimes we take that verse and we equate it that God is going to remove me from my present circumstance or my situation, and that's going to minimize and eliminate my fears. No. Sometimes what God does is leave you in the midst of the situation in order that you will trust him in spite of the fear that the situation may be bringing on your life because that creates a greater spiritual dependency upon God so that whatever else is coming down the road of life, you'll know you don't have to fear it because God has delivered you from the previous thing you worry about. Do you feel powerless? The Bible says in Romans 8 and 15, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We've been delivered from that as a child of God because God has delivered us from the fear of death because Christ defeated death. We've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear when we accepted Christ as our Savior, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Dad is always there with us, and Dad has enough power to defeat any bully that may be trying to intimidate us in life and overcome us with the fear of its presence. Do you feel that your fear has devalued your worth to God? Matthew 10 and 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You know, God in this scripture picked the most devalued thing on earth, minimizing it to the value of pennies to remind us of how much greater of importance we are to him that it cost him his son's life and blood, which was priceless in order to pay the price of our sins. Do you feel that your fear has devalued your worth to God, that you're living in fear and you're of no use to God, that's the way Satan wants you to think. But God has placed a far greater value on you in that it cost him his son's life and blood in order to save you. Why would God not stand ready to help you deal with whatever it is that you're afraid of and the fears that dominate you when you have such a high value on your life. Are you afraid to confront your fears because it will involve confronting people? You know, a lot of what we're fearful of involves people. A lot of what interjects fear into our life comes because of what somebody has done to us, somebody is doing to us, or what we're afraid they might do to us. Well, Hebrews 6, 13 and 6 says this, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. The Bible also said in Psalms 56 and 4, again written by the psalmist who was a hunted and pursued man, he said, in God, I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do to me. You can be delivered from your fear when you quit worrying about what people might do to you because all people stand before God and God can deal with all people. Now, let me ask you to make a commitment today in closing. If you are a person who has never put your trust in Christ, don't be afraid to ask him to forgive you of your sins so that you can spend an eternity in heaven. You see, the way Satan, you know, I started off by saying that as a society, we are programmed to be fearful. We're afraid that we might catch something. We're afraid that something might happen to us. We're afraid that somebody might do something to us. We're just conditioned to be afraid when God wants to condition us to be fearless. The Bible says in Psalms 103, 13, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. 
if you are a person who's never put your trust in Christ, Satan would like to get you to be so afraid to approach God and ask him to forgive you of your sins that if Satan has a choice in the matter, he's going to cause you to live in that fear all of your life right up until the point you die, at which time it's too late to do anything about it. God isn't unapproachable. Don't be afraid to approach God and say, God, I'm a sinner, and forgive me of my sins and give me that gift of eternal life. I know I'm not worthy of it. I know that there's nothing I can do that I would ever earn it. But God, forgive me of that sin. You see, Satan wants you to live in fear that you're afraid to approach God and ask him for that because he knows that when you do, you have the power of God's love not only to overcome your fear of death, but to overcome the fear of anything that may happen to you while you live on this earth until such time God calls you home. And Satan is afraid that you will exercise your God-given right to ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And that's why he intimidates you and he brainwashes you and he misleads you and he lies to you that God sees no value in you. God saw enough value in you like he saw enough value in me that he put his son's life on the cross and he paid the ultimate price so that you could come to God today and receive him as your savior. Secondly, if you're a child of God, and the fear of this world is dominating your life, make these commitments. Ask God to help you in the area of your fears. Philippians 4 and 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request unto God. He already knows what you're afraid of anyway. He's just asking and waiting for you to relinquish control over it and quit trying to do it your way and quit trying to worry your way out of it and just relinquish control over it and say, God, I know I'm sealed by your blood. By your son's blood, I'm giving it over to you. Second thing, let God help by doing your fighting for you. You know, God is often the last person we call on as Christians in order to help us overcome our fears. 2 Chronicles 20, 15 says, Do not fear nor be discouraged because of the vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. Your battle with your fear is yours until you let God battle for you. Remember, thirdly, that God said he would never leave you. In Deuteronomy 31 and 8, he says, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's not a request. That's a directive. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged because those are evidences that fear is dominating your life. Fourth thing, be as determined to be at peace as you are to remain afraid. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives because, the world, hey, the world has no peace to offer, okay? What's it got to give? Nothing. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, John 14, 27. Let me close by giving you a story to illustrate this. It's in the book of Judges, chapter 6 and 7, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. There's a group called the Midianites that are coming up against the Israelites, and the Midianites have been suppressing Israel forever. If you listen to my morning devotions that I give on Facebook, you remember that we talked about the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. The Midianites were descendants going back to Abraham and one of his sons. The Midianites were tormenting the Israelites. They had them suppressed. They had him in bondage, and that was because the Israelites had surrendered to the worship of Baal. That didn't work out so good for them, and God sent this man named Gideon, and God sent Gideon in to destroy the temple and the items of Baal, and the first person that that Gideon sent by God had to deal with in order to release the people of Israel from their bondage was the Israelites themselves, but God made a statement In Judges chapter 6 and verse 23, when he was about to send Gideon in against all odds, when he was about to send Gideon in against his own people, this is what God said to Gideon in chapter 6 of the book of Judges, verse 23. But the Lord said unto him, peace, exclamation mark. If you want peace from the things that you are fearful of, you're going to have to give them over to God. And you're going to have to let God fight with you and for you. 
He said, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. You know, when it comes to the things that we fear in this life, we need to measure them against what should be the ultimate fear. The ultimate fear should be when we die. But as a child of God, we don't have to live in the fear of what happens when we die because we know Christ is our Savior. And one of the things God tries to get across to us as his children is, I don't want you to live in fear until you do die. It's counterproductive. It's not reflective of my son who lives within you. It's not a good reflection of the power of the Holy Spirit that has given us the power to overcome everything, including those things that we fear. It doesn't show that we've been reading God's Word and that we've been storing His Word up in our hearts so that we wouldn't sin against Him. And it certainly is counterproductive to the examples that He has given us in His Word of people like Gideon, who went on and with just 300 people kicked their tails. Why? Because Gideon said, I know who I'm going to put my trust in. I know where my peace is. I know that all this stuff that's happening to me here and now on this earth isn't going to matter in eternity. We endure it for the time. We fight for it in the moment. And we fight with it for as long as we live. But it will not have the final say, whatever it is that's causing us so much fear in our life. Because as a child of God, we can live with the peace of knowing that one day we're going to be in a place where fear is never going to be mentioned in our vocabulary. You're here listening today. You never ask Christ to save you. Why don't you confront your greatest fear, which is being separated from God and be united with God through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross of Calvary to pay your sin debt. And as a child of God living in fear, I hope that what you receive today causes you to pause and realize living in fear is a choice, not God's choice, your choice. God has something better for you. He has peace. Father, just pray that you would just uh, give us that peace that you give us. Father, it is really challenging living in these times, especially when we're conditioned to be fearful. We're afraid to touch doorknobs. We're afraid to pump the gas. We're afraid of this, that. We're afraid of, you know, of our jobs. We're fearful for whether we'll get a job. We're fearful of whether our family, you know, will hold together in these difficult times. So many things that Satan uses to just drive a wedge between us and you by bringing fear into our hearts. But I pray, Father, that we found a, a moment of peace and reconciliation to realize that as your children, that we don't have to live in fear. We choose to live in fear. And may we, with the holy boldness, beat back the fear that seeks to dominate us by relying on your word and taking you at your word. That you say there's no reason for us to fear because you are with us. Like a father protecting us, you will shield us because we know ultimately you will call us into your presence and we'll be free from all the things that cause us fear on this earth. Help us to focus on that instead of the things that are driving the fear in our life, that we may reflect to a people that are dominated, conditioned, socialized to be fearful, that we would be the example of how to live in peace in spite of fearful times. Just pray that you bless us till we meet again. We ask all these things in the name of Christ the Savior and all God's people said, amen. You can get a copy of the notes by going to selenembc.org. You can also keep up with all the other activities and announcements that are going on at our church. Uh, to those of you that are not part of our membership, we're glad that you joined us today. To our membership, we're glad that you joined us today. Uh, please just stay in touch on the website. We'll deliver messages through it regarding starting back on May 31st at 11 o'clock with the morning worship service will be when we'll come back together physically as a congregation, but spiritually we're tighter than we've ever been before. Pray that you receive a blessing out of the day. We're going to go out listening to some music from some of our members and those folks associated with Celine Missionary Baptist Church, and we'll see you next week at this time here on 101.1 FM, The Answer. 
or on Facebook Live. Thank you. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within to the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you.
YourHealthPlanMan.com has a very important message for you, especially if you are on a health plan through the marketplace. Many, including Pat and his wife, have experienced just how unaffordable the affordable care... Closely. Even though 